Okay, welcome to 3.2.1. Uh, this is just yet another series of vocabulary definitions leading up to introducing the meat of chapter 3. Uh, so for 3.2.1, we're going to start introducing what's called a Hermitian operator. So uh, if we refer back to chapter 2, uh, we have this idea of expectation values. So given some value, given some observable Q, the expectation value of Q is defined as the integral uh, of psi star multiplied by the operator of q, q hat, acting on psi. And in terms of inner product notation, which we defined in 3.1, this can then be written as just the inner product between psi and q hat psi. Now, this is where we're going to note something particular. So remember, q defines an observable value. So the whole point that we defined this in chapter 2 was because we wanted to find the expected value for certain things. These things being things like position, velocity, acceleration, energy, so on, so on, so on. These are called observables and they define physical measurements. Now if we're making a physical measurement of something, we expect that measurement to be real. So therefore, since Q defines a physical measurement, uh, we have to say that Q is therefore real, and since Q is real, the same can be said of its expectation value. So what that tells us is that the expectation value of Q is real, which means that it equals its complex conjugate. In terms of this inner product notation, we saw earlier before uh, in 3.1 that we could switch the order of the inner product by basically taking its complex conjugate. So given G and F as an inner product, this is actually exactly the same as the complex conjugate of the inner product between F and G. So if we combine this with the fact that you know Q is something that is real and therefore has the same real value as its complex conjugate value, then what we can say is that for operators, we have that the inner project of F with Q hat acting on F is exactly the same as the inner product of Q hat acting on F with F. Because if we flip this around, right, according to this rule, since the complex conjugate of Q is exactly the same as Q, this can just be done. We can directly set these equal to each other. And when this happens, we call Q a Hermitian operator. So Q is a Hermitian operator. And since in quantum mechanics, uh, basically any observable value that you're trying to measure is, you know, a physically real thing, uh, all observables have to be a Hermitian in quantum mechanics. So in QM, all observable operators are Hermitian. Where observable operator basically refers to the operator Q hat defining anything that is a physically measurable thing in our system position, velocity, acceleration, energy, so on, so on, so on. Uh, and actually in quantum mechanics, we have an even more widely general definition, which is instead of F and F, we say it for two, for any two functions, F and G. So in quantum mechanics, the more commonly used definition is that a Hermitian variable uh, is one such that the inner product between F and Q hat acting on G is exactly the same as the inner product of Q hat acting on F and G. Uh, and this can, uh, this is actually an identical definition as the one we defined over here. And we're going to actually prove this in chapter three, but for now, I'm just going to leave it at this. Uh, so as an example of this, let's consider the momentum operator. So we know that a P hat operator is defined as negative I H bar D by DX. So let's consider two functions F and G in Hilbert space. And let's take the inner product of F and P hat G. Jeez. 
pi hat g. There we go. So if I write this out fully, then this is equal to the integral from negative infinity to infinity of negative i h bar. Uh, and you know what? Actually, just to keep the order consistent, I'm going to write f star at the front times negative i h bar times dg by dx. dx. And now uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use integration by parts. So what I'm going to say is, well, I'm going to start by bringing out the negative i h bar dg by dx. And I'm going to say, OK, let's say that u is equal to f star, which implies that du is equal to df star by dx, dx, sorry, uh, yeah. And then dv is equal to dg by dx, dx, which means that v is equal to g. Uh, and if I write this out fully, then this is equal to negative i h bar times uv, which is f star g, integral from negative infinity to infinity, or defined from negative infinity to infinity, minus integral of v du. So minus the integral from negative infinity to infinity of g df star by dx dx. Now, via boundary conditions, because of the fact that we require our functions to be finite, uh, or sort of uh, finitely integratable, uh, f star and g must both go to zero at infinity and, and negative infinity. Uh, we've proved this many times before in earlier problems in chapter two, so if you're not familiar with this, please go back and review that. But this is something that we've basically defined for a long time. This, by definition, is always going to equal zero, assuming that our wave functions f and g are actually valid. Uh, because if these functions didn't go to zero at infinitely far away, then they're then the integrals of their magnitude squared would basically go to infinity. So that's not possible if we want to be in Hilbert space. Therefore, this always goes to zero. This means that we have i h bar integral from negative infinity to infinity g df star by dx dx. Uh, let's see. I feel like I'm missing a negative here. Ah, OK. No, I'm not actually missing anything here. Uh, apologies. So this is then equal to, so what I can do here is I can bring the i h bar into the d by dx of f star and rewrite this as the integral from negative infinity to infinity of g times negative i h d f by dx star. So basically uh, I took the complex conjugate and extended it to cover also the i h bar, therefore turning the i into a negative i. And I close this with dx. Uh, and if I rewrite this, so that this thing, uh, the complex conjugate, is first. This is going to give me negative i h bar df by dx star g dx. Or uh, if I bring this whole thing, this interior thing, out of the uh, complex conjugate, then I just get uh, that this is equal to, uh, in terms of the, whoops. Yeah, if I bring this out, then this is just equal to p hat star times f star times g dx, or the complex, uh, not the complex, the inner product between p hat and f and g. And since this is exactly equal to this, I can say that this is ultimately equal to the inner product of f and p hat acting on g. Therefore, p hat is Hermitian. Uh, now, in contrast to that, if we have operators that aren't Hermitian, uh, then we define what's called a Hermitian conjugate, also known as the Hermitian adjoint. So this is yet just another vocabulary term we're introducing. Basically, uh, if q hat is not Hermitian, Then you have this definition, which is that the inner product of f with q hat acting on g is going to equal the Hermitian conjugate. And we use something like a little dagger here, uh, acting on f with g. So basically, q hat dagger 
is the Hermitian conjugate. So in these cases, uh, for operators that aren't Hermitian, uh, if you switch around, right, then f q hat g, taking this inner product, this is not necessarily equal to q hat f g anymore. So in order to define the Hermitian conjugate, this is basically uh, the thing such that q conjugate is equal to basically the complex conjugate of Q, effectively. Whoops, I just zoomed way in. Yeah, so Hermitian conjugate is basically just a fancy way of writing the complex conjugate of an operator. And uh, with that, we are done defining Hermitian operators, and we can move on to the actual problems for 3.2.1. Okay, so this final part isn't something that Griffiths really mentions, but it's something that I feel uh, would help a little bit in sort of digesting what we just learned uh, because we sort of just threw out this concept of Hermitian conjugates uh, and Hermitian operators without really understanding where they come from uh, because uh, something that I feel like some people, some of you might be confused by is how P hat is Hermitian. Oops, I misspelled this. Uh, and this point of confusion, uh, which I'm expecting some of you to have, comes from this idea that, you know, p hat is equal to negative i h bar d by dx. So there's clearly an imaginary number here. So how can this be Hermitian? Because Hermitian is defined, her, the idea of Hermitian comes from the fact that the operator you're working with represents, you know, a real quantity, right? Momentum is a physically observable thing, it will always be real. If it's always real, how can its operator be defined with an imaginary term? So this is where I want to clearly define the idea that an operator is not the same as an actual value, right? Operator does not equal observable value. So just because our operator contains an imaginary in it, it doesn't necessarily mean that this thing is actually what the value we get, right? Because the whole point of linear algebra on quantum mechanics is that operators act on the matrix system defining our um, wave function and that gives us real values. Uh, if you really want to sort of uh, go a little bit deeper into the stuff that eventually we're going to introduce in this chapter, what's really happening is that if you act on the wave function with an operator, right, p hat psi, this provides you with a real observable value, let's call it like, for p it's going to just be p psi, right? If you act on psi with an operator, you get basically the same wave function back, and you also get an actual real value. This is the actual observable. So basically, Hermitian operators are operators where if this is Hermitian, then when it acts on your wave function, it's going to give you a real value back. In contrast, if you just had an arbitrary, you know, Hermitian, a non-Hermitian operator, Q hat, let's say Q hat is not Hermitian, then what's gonna happen is that Q hat is gonna act on your wave function psi, and you're gonna get some value Q, uh, and this thing is not necessarily real. And if it's not necessarily, if it's not real, then it's not going to represent a physically observable value because physically observable things are not imaginary, right? There's no such thing as an imaginary position. There's no such thing as imaginary time. There's no such thing as imaginary energy. So ultimately, uh, Hermitian, the, the whole idea of like a Hermitian operator is basically some operator which can act on your wave function and produce an actual real value at the end. And uh, the way that this is actually done is going to get sort of covered later down the line in chapter three uh, as we keep on going down to like the later points, but I just sort of wanted to give a general idea of this because I know that some people tend to be confused 
uh, when trying to learn about Hermitians because they are like, what the heck? These operators, you know, have imaginary terms in them. If the whole point of Hermitian is that it comes to define real variables, then how could the operators possibly have imaginaries? And the reason why they can have imaginaries is because, you know, you're not measuring the operator, you're acting the operator on your wave function, and that produces a real value uh, through some messy mathematical interaction between the operator and the wave function. 